The next is, the picture is next, I guess. A row of tenements. This is the tenement building on South Street where those two people worked, I mean lived. Um, the, the front of this, the back of this building, you, which is the front really, is on South Street. The back side you're looking at is against the river. The front side had, everyone had, they were like a townhouse. You owned the up and the down. It was a family, lived in the whole, uh, from bottom to top. It was like a row house or a townhouse. It was a factory built for the employees to work, uh, who worked there. And this was on Main Street about 1835. They burned in 1880. There were two brick houses on the site of the new town hall that was built in 1872, right after they became a town. So the tenement building in the front had little flower gardens in front of each doorway. The back side, you notice there were some outhouses there too, and gardens in the back for the vegetables. This was the first store, the old red house, painted red, because the first store was built in 1790. It was 12 by 20 feet. It was where the Lewis block is, which is now, Aston Framing is on the corner. It's the flat, flat iron building, triangular. And um, the Aston Framing is there. It used to be um, the drugstore, the Kirkpatrick's. It was Wheeler, Wheeler Drugs, it was called. The store was built by Gerald Cranston in 1790. And he, they were full of stories. This, it's about people, remember? So anyway, he was a partner with Francis Barnard. And one day an Indian entered the store, the worst for liquor. He was too noisy for a free show. And as a final result in the interest of good order and perfect decorum, Mr. Barnard took hold of him and after a, and after a short tussle put him out. Indians started for Nobility Hill, Washington Street, Nobility Hill. When near the residence of Solon Wood, he sat down on the bank. A thunder shower was in progress at the time, and the Indian shook his fist at the lightning, defying its power. Soon after, he returned to the store and told Mr. Barnard if he would give him his tomahawk, he would go away. His word was taken, and he kept it. Mr. Barnard was born in 1768, and he died uh, in 1858 when he was 90 years old. It's amazing how many people lived to be 90 years old without a doctor or any medicine or any vitamin pills. I guess they just lived right. The next picture is about a picture of Felton House, which is really a hotel. <clears throat> it was built in 8, 1803. It was raised uh, to make the Chase Building, which is the building um, right next to the alleyway that goes down to South Street, opposite the bank. There's a bridal shop in one section of that. It's just been made over, the Chase Building, been made over uh, into some co office condos. Not full, just some for rent. So it was a hotel. It had gardens on one side for the vegetables, for the meals, for the people who stayed at the hotel. There were apple trees. This is on Main Street. There were apple trees all around it. Upstairs on the left there, where the stairway is, was a dance hall was upstairs. Very popular place. People could have a, a, a live band music and dancing. Gradually, it was taken over by the Baptist Church. There was no church building, so they used it for a church. In 1820, the population was 100 people. So up that stairway on the end there, upstairs would be the hall where the Baptist Church uh, was in session. And the next one shows when they got more people and some money ahead, they built a church. The early Baptist Church was right behind now the Unitarian Church. It was in, on Church Street, just behind the Unitarian Church, a little ways behind it. This was the first church in Hudson. <clears throat> and it, the minister was the next picture, was Reverend Wakefield, um, was the minister there from 1840. 
until 1865. He was here for 25 years. It was the only church in town. Um, in the early, early days of Marlboro in towns, you were, um, everyone was charged like a tax to maintain the church. Church was very important to those early patriots and pilgrims, and each person was uh, taxed to maintain a church. This was the only church we had. <clears throat> the next building shows right down in Wood Square. You can, I think, um, Lord uh, Dubois would tell you. One of these is his houses, way back here. The river is right behind this building, and these are the uh, in here. Um, and one of these is Julian Dubois. He would tell you about here. Oh, Lloyd Dubois. Um, would tell you that was his barn or his house there. The Trowbridge Shoe Shop. This was 1866. He went, did a lot of, of conversation, of writing about, in these first nine articles about the shoe business, because it was, he made shoes. He was 13. He was working in the shoe shop in the back of his house. Francis Brigham went to work for Lorenzo Stratton in Hill, October 1831. His father went to work. He was 18 years of age, and he worked for shoes. During the year, he made for Stratton 1,300 pairs of shoes. These are all done by hand. The records show he did his last work for Stratton in 1834. That's about six years. And this, um, this Wilbur hadn't been born yet. His father was making shoes. But he left Mr. Stratton. About this time, he founded his own company, F. Brigham and Company. William Trowbridge, 1843, this building here, went to work for Brigham. When Francis Brigham left Stratton, he built his own place. And this William Trowbridge went to work for Brigham for $12 a month. That's, you work six days a week, and you work from dawn till dark. And he worked for six months for uh, Mr. Brigham at $12 a month. In 1843, Nathaniel Smith went to work for $18 a month, but he charged his, uh, his own board at home. You got uh, 20 cents a day was for board. So you could board with Mr. Um, Brigham. If you worked for Mr. Brigham, he had rooms for he would rent out, and his wife, I guess, would, somebody would cook the food or allow you to eat there for 20 cents a day. So it was... Uh, $12 a month or 18 if you board yourself out, if you had your own family. 50 years ago, this is 1883, 50 years ago in, in 1840, wood sold for $2 a cord, cider for 75 cents a barrel, milk for 3 cents a quart, and the best workman earned a dollar and a quarter a day. Another shoe factory. Stowe Bill's Holly Factory. Edmund Stowe, the first name there, went to work for Brigham and Company in 1851. He worked for six months for $1.37 a day. He worked hard, earned his money. He, in company with Reuben Hapgood, took the job of cutting all the stock. That paid more money, $1.50 a day, if you cut the stock. And that time they thought it was a regular bonanza to get a dollar fifty instead of a dollar thirty-seven a day. They worked together until 1853, when Stowe thought he would strike out in business for himself. So Stowe Bills and Holly Factory was a thirty by sixty foot building in 1858, and five years later they added ninety more feet because they had so much work to do. And in 10 more years, they added two more wings. So it became a big, a big company. It was the biggest company. How big? The next picture shows how big. Here's the M. Stowe's house <laughs> on Forest Avenue, which is not there anymore. It was raised um, because it was empty for a few years. The E.M. Stowe Mansion. That is a mansion. Look at that. 
the corner, the corner of Forest Avenue, right next to the town uh, municipal office uh, building there, on the corner of what, Marlborough Street and Forest Avenue, up and back. The stone walls are still there and the front of the street and up the driveway for to go to this house. Opposite that Apple Country um, market there, you know, the key corner to that. His daughter married Mr. Middleton. If you go up Marlborough Street a little further, on your left is a big white farmhouse. That's the Middleton farm. Mr. Stowe had this mansion. He had gardeners. He had the finest gardens in all of Middlesex County. He shipped his produce to Boston, uh, perfect produce, and he had that whole um, apple orchard on the way up the hill to Intel was all apples, if you remember, only 20, 30 years ago. It was still all apples, the Middleton Orchards, it was called. So here's Mr. Stowe's mansion. This is how well he did <laughs> in his little shoe shop. <clears throat> It was one of the largest firms in the world. And then next we have Joseph Bradley, um, another shoe man, and his company follows the Bradley Sawyer Shoe Company, the next one. These are all tall wooden buildings, <clears throat> big windows, because you only work by daylight. You walked when the sun came up and when it was dark, you had to quit work. So they all had big windows and they're all wood. So they didn't perhaps last as long as they could have. Most of them burned uh, from the oils and the, the dust and dirt that was inside the building. The Bradley Sayward Company. So how did they make shoes in those days? They made them by hand out of leather, but they made the, these are wood pegs. That's how, they didn't have stitching because there was no power to run the sewing machine. They didn't have tacks and nails. They used little wooden pegs like a fat toothpick, half an inch long. They were five-eighths of an inch long, but you had to use an awl and make a hole to put the peg in. Wood, you know, a wooden peg you couldn't pound, it would break. But you had to make a hole first with an awl and then pound this in. Well, he invented a wood pegging machine he evidently made a, gr a group of holes and the pegs would be used in. If you go to the museums, which we have done in Marlborough and Westboro and Northborough, they show you these little wooden pegs. But the pegging machine was invented by uh, Wilbur, uh, by Mr. Brigham, Francis Brigham, as Wilbur's father. So now we have finished our first uh, nine stories. We go on to what is the beginning of Hudson here, the first grist mill. This was built in uh, 1699, right where Washington Street Bridge is now. That's where the same river, the Estimate River, goes through town. We needed a grist mill because there was corn and barley and grains to be ground. We had the water power. So everybody in Marlborough had to come over to the mill, called the mills, uh, to have their grains ground to make uh, the food that they needed. Abraham Howe came here in 1657. His son Joseph built a grist mill on the falls of the swift-moving river, grinding corn and rye for his patrons from Marlborough and from Sudbury and there was a grist mill, as you know, the wayside in there. Um, there was always a mill, a mill there. And Barnard continued to run this mill. He, uh, he Barnard owned all the land in Hudson. They, uh, they kept buying the, the, the land as it came available. And all of that land became Fountainville. So if you're going to talk about the early days of Hudson, you have to talk about Indians. They were here first. The Cub Scouts were supposed to be at the museum yesterday. I wasn't there. Um, and they love to hear the stories about the Indians. You can't be a pilgrim or a patriot or a New Englander without knowing that there were Indians here first. So the next picture we have.